They print new money every day. If you look at the European balance sheet for the last three years, you see that they printed $700 billion. What I was thinking and what I'm wondering is, who has this money? When we went there a year before, I had the same card and it was like 120. So I was expecting maybe 150, 160, but not 400 or 300. So it's ridiculous. I hope we can help to prevent CBDCs to come to life ever. The idea behind the digital euro is to become independent from other payment service providers. The price it comes with is total control. The statement of the European Central Bank that the digital euro is not programmable is a straight out lie. If you really want to be independent, you use Bitcoin. That's superior money. They don't want open source. They want surveillance tools. They don't want you to be free. They want to control everything. They put on regulations. They put on technology. They have face recognition. They, they regulate everything. It's like a total disaster. In Visa, they can do 40,000 maybe or maybe 50,000, whatever. Now, here's the difference. If we go one step up on a layer two technology, which is the lightning uh, network, for example, we can do more than 40,000. We can do 100,000. We can do a million TPS. I take responsibility for my Bitcoin. I take responsibility for my life. Hey, I take even responsibility for what I'm eating. You are working uh, in a bank. You're promoting Bitcoin. You're demoting. I, I I say demoting uh, CBDCs, <laughs> your warning of the dangers, your right. orange billing other banks. I think uh, that's that's a great uh, segue into uh, the, the Bitcoin podcast in, in general. Um, so like before we start with the topics, what are you doing and why are you doing that? Oh, that's a good question. And uh, actually, I do not work in a bank. I work with banks. I'm a consultant to banks. And uh, I started um, in technology like 40 years ago. And uh, I'm not a, tech, a, a technologist by myself. I just uh, do the marketing sales and I understand technology and I'm always excited about latest technology developments. And um, a huge part of our clients at the time were uh, network marketing companies, people who were selling to the direct sales uh, from one person to the next. And there is two kind of these kind of direct marketing. One of them is legal and the other one is illegal. So the illegals are called the Ponzi schemes and uh, the legal ones are um, selling like insurances, financial in, uh, things. They, um, uh, they are selling uh, food supplements and things like that. So I was providing technology to these people. And one day, one of my customers in 2016 came along and said, hey, this Bitcoin, that's a Ponzi scheme, is it? And my initial reaction was, of course, yeah, sure. So he needed a uh, forensics uh, expert witness statement for a lawsuit. And I took on uh, the order and we dove uh, deep dived in it and found out Bitcoin is not a Ponzi scheme. But we accumulated a lot of knowledge. And at the end of the time, at the end of the day, we had like 2,000 pages of knowledge. And I decided to uh, repurpose it and publish a book, actually the first book in German language and one of many in the English language. It was called Bitcoin, Blockchain and Co. The Truth, Nothing But The Truth. This book was also at the time dealing with blockchain a lot because in 2016, 2017, blockchain was the big thing. In the meanwhile, I uh, do have a very deep understanding on uh, Bitcoin and on blockchain and on crypto. And today I'm just promoting Bitcoin because anything else beside crypto, uh, beside Bitcoin is crypto. It's not that secure, not that uh, immutable like anybody thinks. And blockchain is not like the holy grail of the future. So there's a lot of reasons why I decided to go only Bitcoin. But one of the things what happened in the last three or four years was, of course, that Facebook started to promote Libra or DM at the end. And that was a new currency which Facebook wanted to bring onto the market, which pushed up the whole markets of uh, digital currencies. Now, all the central banks got very, very scared about that. And at the end of the day, they just uh, prohibited Facebook in doing that and anybody else because they wanted to maintain their monopoly. So like a few years later, like in 2020 or so, they came to the great idea that they wanted to push out their own version of a digital currency. And that is what this, they call the central bank digital currency, CBDCs. So I got involved in that by knowledge. 
and found out that this is like the most dangerous thing ever, whatever can happen to us in the future. And based on my, my, my love to books and my me having fun writing books, I also wrote a book about the danger of CBDCs. And this is where we stand today. And I hope we can help to prevent CBDCs to come to life ever. And I guess this is one of the topics we want to talk to about today, right? Absolutely. Uh, CBDCs are really interesting um, because it's also for me, I have guests all around the world from, from Germany, from uh, Africa, from America, from Australia. And uh, people from Africa, they don't worry about CBDCs at all. Uh, and people from Europe uh, and America and developed countries way more. Um, yeah. So like why are why are CBDCs so dangerous? Well, the reason, uh, let, let's look at how they promote the CBDCs, or let's look especially to the digital euro. The European Central Bank is promoting the digital euro as a tool or a means of being independent from the American payment service providers like MasterCard, PayPal, and all the others. So the idea behind the digital euro is to become independent from other payment service providers, which is a good idea if you just take it alone. The price it comes with is total control. And this is basically, uh, and we can go right to the core of the whole issue. The digital euro by itself and any other CBDC, the, the digital dollar or the digital yen or whatever it is, by definition, it is a piece of software because it's digital. So there's no way it cannot be a piece of software. And any kind of software which is controlled by a single entity can be reprogrammed in a way that this single entity can benefit the most. Now, if Facebook tomorrow changes the algorithm because they can accelerate sales in advertisement spending, they will do so. If the European Central Bank tomorrow can benefit controlling people's spending, they can reprogram this digital euro in a way so that they can achieve their goal real easy. The statement of the European Central Bank that the, European, uh, the digital euro is not programmable is a straight out lie. And if they can program it, they can program it in any kind they like to the disadvantage of everybody. And that's basically the core of the issue. A lot of people, especially in the outside of the Bitcoin world, uh, tell me like, oh, like what's what's the, the question always comes like, oh, what's the difference between the euro that we have now? Because like most of it is already digital uh, and the digital euro. I think like most people outside of the informed Bitcoin crowd are like, okay, what's, what's the difference is because like they already can basically uh, stop a lot of things and they can already do a lot of things. But what's the, the main difference between the CBDCs that uh, the euro uh, is planning and uh, right now digital euro? Well, these are two totally different animals. And I do understand that ev the most people don't understand the difference. Now, if you look at to, uh, into the currency, the, the euro by itself we do have two different kinds of euros at least two different kinds which anybody knows one is the cash which is the bills and uh, the coins and the other one is our online banking like whatever it is now between these two is a big difference cash is only produced and is only allowed to be produced and can only be produced by the central bank european central bank so your bank May it be a Volksbank, may it be a Sparkasse, may it be Deutsche Bank, Commerzbank, whatever bank cannot produce cash. They cannot print bills, they cannot print or press coins. The online version, the online banking, what you see on your online banking account, that is from the bank, not from the European Central Bank. That's a big difference. And the way money comes to life, so to speak, is created, is that the bank is giving you a credit by just putting money onto your account, which comes out of the nowhere. It's just digital 
money which is created by the bank and it's put onto your account so you can spend it. That's what the, how the whole system works. But the European Central Bank has no say in whatsoever. The European Central Bank cannot come to the bank and say, hey, Robin, please give him a million uh, euros or dollars as a credit. They can't do it. The bank is responsible. The bank creates the money and the bank uh, provides it to you or not. Now, with the central bank digital currency, the digital euro, you are, do not have an account with the bank, but you have an account with the European Central Bank. And now you talk to the European Central Bank and they provide you the money on a European Central Bank digital euro account, which maybe in the beginning is parallel structure to the bank. And you can use that money and you can spend it if they provide it to you. If they decide they don't want to provide anything to you, they just can take it away. So it's a parallel system, a par parallel infrastructure, which is one of the, the downsides of the whole idea that they have to build up a parallel system which costs billions of euros to build it up, which has extra friction in it, which makes the whole thing even more complicated and more sophisticated with no need at all. But this is the difference between the digital euro, which you do use in your online banking, and the digital euro, which is issued as a CBDC from the European Central Bank. So they would completely cut out uh, the commercial banks and would go directly yeah. to, to the consumer. Is that why yes. you are uh, working for uh, or with a commercial bank uh, is like the commercial bank should actually embrace <laughs> Bitcoin because like the, the fiat system kind of cuts them out now? Not necessarily. I, I believe everybody should embrace Bitcoin because that's the third or the like the superior money which you can think of. And we can, let's, let's go back to the first statement where I said the European uh, Central Bank stated that they want to be independent from the service providers like Master PayPal, MasterCard, Visa, whatever. Hey, you can be independent right now if you use Bitcoin. There is nobody in the world who can control, manipulate Bitcoin in any way. So if you really want to be independent, you use Bitcoin. That's the superior, superior money. That's health money, healthy money. And The reason why I support Bitcoin is because of that. I don't even give, I don't, I don't care about banks. I don't care about uh, the European Central Bank if it comes to money. I care about immutable ledgers. I care about freedom. I, I care about open access. I care about uh, limited uh, supply and all those things. That's what Bitcoin has. However, to get this information to the people, And where do people have their money? At banks. So we need to talk to banks and we need to educate them. And also we need to show them that the digital euro is a huge, huge threat to them. Because at the end of the day, the European Central Bank will have their customers, not the bank. You and I will have an account with the European Central Bank. So if the European Central Bank tomorrow decides we don't need the banks anymore, we just cut them off. That's easy done. If you have Bitcoin... Bitcoin cannot switch off a bank. Bitcoin just can add on to the satisfaction of the customers in the bank. And if you have a bank which is providing financial service and is for, for you helping you to increase your financial freedom, then Bitcoin should be part of this. You should, if, if you want to save money, if you want to build your um, fortune, You may need to invest in different infrastructures and in different assets. You may need to invest in, in shares. You may need to invest in ETFs and things like that. But also you should invest today. You should also invest a little bit at least in Bitcoin. So that's not a threat to the banks. It's just an add-on. It's an additional tool and additional asset. That's the difference between European Central Bank uh, digital money and Bitcoin. I think that makes it very clear, really cool. Uh, thank you for that. Um, how, how close do you think are we to that CBDC? I mean, we then have to also look at different countries. I think in America, where actually like most of the audience is, is in America as English, English speaking. Um, in America, they are quite opposed to it, yeah. at least way yeah. more than, yeah. than the, than the uh, European zone. How is the current landscape and how close are we? 
Uh, I, I wouldn't say the Americans are so much smarter uh, in general, but in CBDCs, they are very smart, way smarter than the Europeans, because they just polit political parties, and I think it's bipartisan in the United States, is that they say no CBDCs. They totally understand the control. They totally understand the dependence on the Fed in the United States. If they allow the Fed to interact with their lives on a direct way, they don't want that. The Europeans are not that smart in that, in, if you look at it. And Europeans are also kind of what I think the European Central Bank will do. And, and this shows how what kind of mean spiel that all is. I'm pretty sure they will incentivize if you use the digital euro. For example, if you buy something they want you to buy, they give you an extra discount. So they're manipulating people in it. And if they do it to over a period of time, they'll eventually it'll come out with a survey which says, uh, we found out 82% of all payments are now by the digital euro. So we don't need the other payments uh, systems anymore and they just switch over to the digital euro in total. That is a manipulation they can do by nudging the people into the digital euro. And uh, this is something the Americans just say, stop. We don't even start that. Bipartisan politicians fighting against it. So there's no way the Fed can install this kind of surveillance tool. Now, in other countries around the world, it's like... Some, sometimes they are not aware of it. Sometimes they don't do it. Sometimes they want to do it. All the approaches they did in the past failed miserably because we were done not so smart. They didn't work correctly. And most important, people just didn't use the CBDC. They didn't want it. They didn't use it. However, I believe if you have real good marketing behind the CBDC, you can make people use it, like I said before, what probably the European Central Bank will do. So the so landscape is, in general, people don't want it because they don't need it. Everything works fine. But if you put a lot of good marketing behind it, you definitely can make it happen and you can make it working. That's my belief. I mean, we kind of already saw with, uh, what was it called? World coin where people like <laughs> scan the iris yeah. for, for, for some shit coin. <laughs> it's, it's pretty right. easy to set incentives. Yeah. That's the, that's the thing, the incentives and what the European, uh, in the U S like, like I said, there is a no, it's, it's just a no. I mean, the difference between the, uh, United States and Europe is that if you in the U uh, S, if you say no, People are carrying weapons, so you shouldn't try it, right? Because they are all <laughs> they have all weapons. In Europe, they don't have weapons. They have a lot a lot of regulations, they have a lot of a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of uh, whatever, and it's all killing everything and the whole Europe is is like plowing itself into a thousand pieces. But then there is this little group of people sitting in the European Central Bank and in other institutions and they know how to market it. Right now they are coming out with communications. They tell people why the European uh, uh, Central Bank needs to issue CBDC. And I haven't heard really, really political uh, parties or politicians say no. They say, oh, okay, yeah, no, no, makes sense. Yeah, uh, no, no. So they are smart. They're using good communications and later on they will good, use good marketing. And at the end of the day, they will reinstall or no, not reinstall. They will establish Orwell's 1984 as a regime in Europe so that everybody and anybody is controlled 24-7. And and that's uh, that's a book that I think also we, we see it in the background uh, that yeah. we wrote with 2024. Um, can, uh, can, can we be... Uh, oh, yeah, that's, that's really cool, uh, the book. Can, uh, like first of all, like what, what's the book about uh, for those people uh, that don't know about it? Yeah, people don't know this book, but hopefully they know Orwell's dystopian novel 1984. Now, what happens in 1984? Um, it did happen in the real world before. That's Orwell's vision, Orwell's book, and he wrote it in 1947. And that was right after Second World War. That was right after the Nazis installed Gestapo. 
which was a, a, a military secret police and a lot of people, millions of people uh, got killed with all this. So under this impression, he wrote 1984. And in 1984, he visions a totalitarian surveillance state where you have the big brother and you have all these screens watching at you all the time. And he describes the journey of a person who is working in a system and then is falling in love and is meeting the girl. And the name is uh, Winston Smith and he's meeting the girl. And at the end, they catch him because he's against Big Brother and the whole story doesn't end well for him. Now, what people didn't know at the time, and this book then was released, as I said, 1947, and it was a future, it was a vision in the future. What people didn't know at the time was that Julia, his girlfriend in the book, was pregnant. And at the end of 1984, she gave birth to a boy. And in 2024, this son of Winston Smith, of the name of Wynn, was 40 years old, was living in the United States, in New York. He was in banking and is meeting a girl. And he comes into a situation where he's also not in alignment with the politics, not in alignment with uh, what people want him to do. So he and his girlfriend then also are escaping, like his father did before. But this time it's not the screens watching him, which are installed all over the place. This time it's because we're using CBDCs and the government know exactly where they went, what they bought, how much they paid, for what. And this is how they catch him at the end of the day. And I don't want to spoil too much of the content. Also, I can say if we allow CBDCs to come true, it's not ending very well. We will end up in this totalitarian surveillance and we need to do everything anything which is legal and everything which is legal to prevent this from becoming true. And I wanted to update 1984 with this book uh, so that the people have like a more, more time realistic scenario. And the difference between 1984 and this book is that Orville in 1947 had to think about technology. How can I, surveil how can i have surveillance items on the people on the masses of people so he invented the screens he invented all the stuff now in 2024 in my book i didn't have to invent any technology all what we need is here and this makes it especially dangerous because we don't need to invent any future technology to do that no it's already here and cbdc's it's called cbdc's it can be used almost Today. So, so you're saying that there is a chance, even in the European Union, that we stop that from happening. And what, what role does Bitcoin play into that? Well, in, primarily, Bitcoin doesn't play any role at it at all. It's just that the Bitcoin people who understand Bitcoin or typically knows a lot about uh, money and understands financial systems so much more than the average person. And I'm sure that these people who understand Bitcoin, who, who think about financial freedom and freedom in general, will rather early understand the danger and hopefully will spread the message. So we can, we can definitely uh, prohibit it from happening, the CBDC, uh, Digital Euro or any other CBDC happen, if the people get up and say no. If the people go to their politicians and tell them to say no. If the awareness of the danger is risen, then it may not happen. If we just sit there and if we are just like the lemmings, we just follow each other and jump over the cliffs, then it's going to, we will end, it, it, it's not, it's not funny. So we need to get up. We need to talk to the people. We need to talk to politicians and we need to do anything in our power, anything legal to prohibit that. And I think Bitcoiners in general, because we're more conscious about the uh, subject, can do a lot more than average Joe who doesn't understand, who just lives day to day. That's why I'm talking to Bitcoiners so, uh, so many times. Uh, that, that's, uh, that, that's very true. Uh, and what, for, for me, it's always interesting um, 
like CBDCs and Bitcoin that's like covers the money part. Um, is there another part to it with maybe social media and big tech with a general war on privacy when we see like, or even open source developers being imprisoned and stuff like that? Is, is that, yeah. uh, is that a, uh, another part to do, do the same thing basically? Of course, of course. I mean, I, I typically say there is a way to implement and install um, CBDCs. And there is two prerequisites to a CBDC. Number one is open source. And number two is 100% privacy. That means uh, zero knowledge uh, technology built in it. And only if I see on open source that this is a, uh, a software which I can use because it has all the prerequisites and all the requirements, then I may be able to use it. And then I may be able to use it. And then I may use it. However, it also needs to have several other technology features, which is like open not only open source, but it needs to be open. It needs to be immutable so that nobody can manipulate it. And it needs to be free and a lot of other features. And if you list all these features and you summarize them up, you have Bitcoin. So it doesn't make any sense to build a system which is already existing. You can save billions of dollars and billions of euros if you just use Bitcoin and then you have the same thing, just better, more freedom and immutable in all these features. Now, that's not what state nation states want. Nation states want control. And in European, uh, European Union, it's even worse. This is like the super nation states, the EU. It's not the Germans, the Italians or the French or the Spanish. It's the EU. There's a group of people who try to get in total control and total power. And of course, they control open source. Uh, they don't want open source. They don't want uh, um, surveillance tools. Well, I mean, they want surveillance tools. They don't want you to be free. They want to control everything. They put on regulations. They put on technology. They have face recognition. They, they regulate everything. It's like a total disaster. And it all gets in the same thing. How do I get total control? And this is exactly what we don't want and where we need to fight against as much as we can that's really interesting does it do, do you think does it come down to either btc or cbdc uh, or might there be like a, a hybrid system i mean it, now we have uh, already a kind of feared uh, bitcoin hybrid system but does it come down to either that or that or can we have long term even a hybrid system i, I do believe we will have a hybrid system uh, the next 10 maybe 20 years or whatever it's very very difficult to uh, pro uh, give a prognosis for the, f in the future here one of the things we need to solve in bitcoin is the payment like how can i pay with bitcoin that, that's one of the things we can we need to solve and this is also one of the areas i'm pretty much investigating and working on because here's the thing, if people from the typical uh, standard financial system from the fiat system comes along and says, yeah, but you can't use Bitcoin as a payment system because it only, only can do five to seven transactions per second. They are right. The blockchain can only do, the Bitcoin blockchain can only do five to seven transactions per second. And Visa, they can do 40,000 maybe, or maybe 50,000, whatever. Now, here's the difference. If we go... One step up on a layer two uh, technology, which is the Lightning uh, Network, for example, we can do more than 40,000. We can do 100,000. We can do a million TPS. That's no problem. We just need to build it. The difference is then if Visa, Master, or whoever it is, wants to go from 40 to 50,000, they need to build a huge, uh, huge uh, new uh, server uh, environment. They need to put in tens of thousands of computers to go from linear from 40 to 50 to 60. Each time we need a new uh, computer system deployed, big, huge farms, server farms, everything. Now with Lightning, we have not a uh, linear sc uh, scale, we have an exponential scale. It means it's like very simple to understand if you look at the network effect. If you have a fax, look at back at the fax machines. We had one fax machine, one guy had one fax machine, it was worth nothing. So then was another guy like you and me, and we could send faxes from me to you and you could fax back. But if we have the third person, we have so much more ways to communicate because then we can talk to, I can talk to you, I can talk to the third person, the third person can talk to you and the third person can talk to me. So 
each each uh, node in the network is adding extra more communication channels and th that's the difference between linear scaling and uh, exponential scaling which we have in in lightning so what i hope what we can achieve is more lightning nodes more better lightning clients better lightning technology and one of the things i'm really excited at the moment i'm investigating very very deeply is a way where you can pay with lightning with satoshis on the lightning network and for the merchant, it gets transferred directly into his fiat currency. And this is something I want to roll out. I want to help rolling out. I hope, and this is also why I do talk to banks, because banks are the bankers of the merchants, of course. So if now the bank, today the bank is going to the merchant and say, here, here's my payment terminal for Visa, Master, whatever it is. And tomorrow we should go and say, here's a payment terminal, which also allows you to accept Bitcoin. And you don't have any risk because Bitcoin is volatile. If you look from the fiat system, from the euro, from dollar to the system, it is volatile. But dear merchant, don't worry about that because we are exchanging directly into euros or dollars or whatever you have on your regular fiat account. And the only difference is you get the payment immediately and you don't have any callbacks. You don't have any chargebacks. And it's so much more cheaper than any of the visas. And, so, and this is the way where we get independent from the visa master and any other payment provider. Not only the Europeans, but everybody. It's cheaper, it's final sale, and it's in real time. And if you can achieve that, and I think we are at the beginning to roll that out, and I think we are at the beginning to have that deployed worldwide, then we don't need to make any other system and we don't even need the established fiat system anymore in a very short period of time, maybe 10, maybe 15, maybe 20 years. If we can't get that off the ground, then we need another technical solution to get that off the ground. If you watch my podcast already for more than two times, you know how extremely passionate I am about self-custody. And the first very, very, very important step to self-custody is always getting yourself a hardware wallet. And I have one for you here. This is the Bitcoin only edition from the Bitbox, my favorite single signature hardware wallet on the market. Another really important piece of self-custody if you have a hardware wallet is the backup of the seed phrase. And Bitbox made the perfect solution to back up your seed phrase. They made a reusable steel wallet. Check out that beauty. It's durable it's extremely heavy. If I put it on the desk, I seriously fear for my own table. It's so, so heavy and durable. I love it. This is where my seed phrase is secure. Go to bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your bitbox. And if you use code Robin, you even get 5% off of your complete order. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You you have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a and perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first 
ever mined Bitcoin block in there. And of course, also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece. And make sure to check out those amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so, so much. And it's, it's really interesting because uh, a lot of people overlook Bitcoin as a payment uh, network because Bitcoin is a payment network and an asset. So like there's, there's right. both sides to it. And, and I think the payment network, a lot of people just <laughs> overlook and don't really look at it uh, and not pay attention to it. So that's, that's a, a really good point there. D do you think we need maybe additional layers even above that if we really yeah. want to yeah. go mainstream? I definitely uh, think we need, because if you have this, you, first you have the Bitcoin blockchain, which is an immutable ledger, which is like the main layer, which is like the stable and secure and immutable base, the fun foundation for everything. And then you have the payment rails on top of that, which is currently the lightning uh, system. But then also you want to have some services on top of that, maybe some what they call smart contracts, like auto payments and things like that. That may be a third layer. Maybe it's integrated to a certain part in the second layer, but maybe it's on top of the third layer. Maybe it's the fourth layer. Maybe you have a lot of layers. And that's okay. Because if you look at the financial system today, you see that there is a foundation. And then you have a layer one, another layer, 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 layer. And they have like 80 or 90 or 100 or 200 layers. The problem with that is, but the foundation is built on sand or on a swampland, not on a real strong foundation. And this is why the bloody system always crashes. This is why we lose our, uh, uh, our savings. This is why we have to pay every year more and more and more for the same products. So this is how the uh, financial system is built, the fiat system. It's built on sand or swampland. Now with Bitcoin, we have this rocket. We have this this 100% safe and secure and immutable base layer, and we build on top of that throughout the next uh, 100 years. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many technology you put on top of it. As long as the base layer is strong enough to support it, you can do anything. There's one component to it uh, for me. That's when we talk about why gold kind of kind of failed because it like you needed to uh, issue IOUs to like actually use it as a payment network. Yes, with Bitcoin you don't need it uh, because you can put it in in layers and and you can uh, transact Bitcoin directly overseas. Like uh, I got the first uh, like one of my sponsors in, is in America and they actually pay me in in Bitcoin, which is an amazing experience because f payments from America to Austria it's a headache if it's not a bitcoin <laughs> it's right, not like the same say, same as here um but how how important in that whole process is self custody because i think sometimes i fear that people hold their bitcoin in exchange and if if that gets mainstream and nobody holds their own bitcoin then we essentially <laughs> have gold again well let me let me just just talk a little bit about gold all we want in Bitcoin or all we can do in Bitcoin, some people claim they can do in gold. And this is a big, big, big mistake. Because the difference between Bitcoin and gold is in the mining. So if you want to mine gold, you need to go into the earth and you need to dig holes and you need to extract gold out of these mines, right? Now... This is a very centralized process. So some people can do that because they have the technology, they have the knowledge, they have the money and so on and so on. What happens if they dig in the, in the earth, they find gold and then it's going like, let's say one, 100 kilos of gold is in this particular mine and it's going to an end. They already have dug up like 89 kilos out of 100. But now all of a the sudden they find another big chunk of gold right next to the mine which has another 100 kilos and this is exactly the difference now they look at the market and say okay before we just sell off all our reserves at the high price before we announce that we found another 100 kilos because that may be an inflation to the gold price yeah but they manipulate with markets and that is on the base layer that's not even on the ious and on all this all certificates on top that's on the base layer 
So there's a manipulation on the base layer. This is not with Bitcoin. You can't manipulate this Bitcoin supply because every 10 minutes, currently you get 1.3, uh, uh, 3.125 Bitcoins every 10 minutes. So every day you have 450 new Bitcoins. There is no way you can change that. If you are in gold mining, you can manipulate a lot. If you're in Bitcoin, you can't do it. So that's a huge difference between gold and Bitcoin. And the other uh, system, of course, is how, how do you pay like uh, a piece of bread, like 20 cents or 15 cents with gold? How do I know that the gold I get is real gold? I don't have the capacity. I don't have the abilities to do that. But I know exactly that if I have six confirmations on the blockchain, that now the Bitcoin, nobody can take away my Bitcoin anymore. And this comes back to what you were asking. If I have it on an exchange, so if I give my Bitcoin to somebody else, he can run off with it. And I shouldn't do that. It's pretty much the same when I go to the bank and ask for buying gold and give it to them to uh, store it. They give me a piece of paper or a digital piece receipt, a digital receipt, and say, now you, we owe you now 100 grams of gold. And then I go there and say, hey, give me the 100 grams of gold. And they say, ah, oh, we can't do that because there's a regulation here and whatever reason, or they just ran off. So anytime you do ha have your assets in custody of somebody else, this somebody else can just run off or just they don't give it to you. So it's always, always, always very important to have it in self-custody. Could, could that be a, a systemic risk for, for Bitcoin or is the possibility to take it in self-custody, this exit valve enough, even if like 90% of people don't have it there? What do you mean by systemic risk? For me, it's like when, when Bitcoin uh, becomes mainstream and uh, we, we don't succeed in educating people in getting them into self-custody and they all hold it on exchange, um, then it's like, oh, is, is that actually Bitcoin or can the, the exchanges then play with the numbers uh, to a certain extent? Um, I think not. Like, I think the, the risk is not there, but it's it's interesting to, to think about that if that might happen, because I know friends that are uh, big time into Bitcoin, but they still are like, oh, I trust the bank. I trust that. Uh, like, yeah. it, it's, it could self-custody not being mainstream be a, a big risk for, for Bitcoin as, as the mission? Not for Bitcoin, but for the users, of course. I mean, anytime, and, and we see that uh, if you if you look around, you, you saw at, in 2008, you saw uh, Lehman Brothers and all the other banks cheating on the customers big time. Uh, you saw it in, in, in Germany especially, and it may have uh, had waves around the world with a company called Wirecard. Uh, they had like $2 billion on their accounts or $2.9 billion on their accounts. This $2.9 billion never existed, never existed. It was just a fraud. It was plain out fraud. You saw Bernie, uh, Bernie Madoff. You saw, uh, you saw a lot of uh, fraud in the financial system. I mean, huge. This is where we don't talk about like uh, 250 grand. We talk about $250 billion or something like that. And this is because banks and financial institutions and actors in the financial world are just cheating, just betraying people badly. And of course, if they have custody of your Bitcoin, they can do anything with your Bitcoin. They can tell you, uh, you have it. And in reality, they just send it off to somebody else. You don't have any control. They can steal, they can betray, they can cheat and you can do anything. This is why you should have your gold and should have your Bitcoins at home. Of course, there's a risk on the other hand, which is with gold. If I know you have gold at home and I talk to my buddy and say, let's go there and take the gold away. So this is a risk. With Bitcoin, this is also a risk to a certain extent, but there's a lot of measurements, cheap measurements you can do to prevent this from happening. Like one of the things is like a multi-sig, which is a few hundred dollars investment but if you have like 10 grand or 100 grand or even more, that's a very good investment. So you don't need to buy a huge safe or uh, a safety box for tens of thousands to uh, store your gold. If you have Bitcoin, just have digital measurements, cheap and very, very secure. 
And yes, you should do that. You should think about it. It's your responsibility. That's the difference between Bitcoin and and the financial system we know is, hey, they do it. They take care of it. I trust them. I don't. I take responsibility for my Bitcoin. I take responsibility for my life. Hey, I take even responsibility for what I'm eating because I want to be healthy for the rest of my life. And if I go to the grocery and eat all this industrial processed food, I'm pretty sure that I get sick. So it has to do with self-conscious. It has to do with self uh, with uh, responsibility. And this is a world we need to, yeah, we need to move to in order to stay happy and healthy. Really, really cool. What do? What role do you see banks uh, take in in the future where in the in the Bitcoin world? Do do banks have like a service where they just help people uh, onboard the multisig, or even like something like Unchained or Castle doing with collaborative custody? Um, what is the future role of of banks in the Bitcoin world? Well, if, if you look at the banks, their mission, the core mission of the uh, like community banks, especially like in, in Europe, the Sparkassen, Volksbank and, and savings and loans in the United States and things like that, they're just the financial partner of the customers and they provide financial services. And that's not limited to uh, credit. That's also helping them to uh, make decisions about the asset allocations, things like that. Of course, to provide payment services, of course, to provide liquidity and all those things. And this won't change if instead of the dollar or the euro, we now do it for Bitcoin. It's a different way of doing it. It's a different technology. But the service at its core is still the same. I be your person helping you with your fi financial duties and financial uh, services. And this is why the bank I uh, I am working with and uh, consult, this is exactly their statement. They say, we, and this bank is 130 years. Next year, they, they will be 130 years. And they say, we had so many different currencies the last 130 years. We didn't have the euro all 130 years. We had the Deutschmark, we had the Reichsmark, we had a lot of other currencies. But that's not what we do. What we do is we help our customers in financial Uh, belongings in financial services in f financial requests that's what we do and bitcoin is a part of it and if you as a bank if you look at it like that then bitcoin is just a natural thing what what they need to embrace and and the credit thing that you said just uh reminded me uh, of what we uh, briefly talked before we recorded what you said like you said it so nicely that uh, we're expanding our balance sheets and monetary policy uh, right now so much uh, what, what's your thoughts around that yeah this is one of the things i discovered lately um i mean we all talk about that we have inflation right I was recently in a, in a um, supermarket in Miami, uh, Florida, and I, I I was just I came to Miami and I went to a supermarket uh, grocery, and there was a guy in front of me, and I, I, I stacked my cart. There was a guy in front of me had like a little more in his cart, but not really more, and he pushed it to the cashier. At the end of the cashier, the lady at the cashier said, "It's four hundred and forty dollars, please." And I was like, what? <laughs> and I was r literally pulling my card out of the chain, out of the queue. And I was setting it aside. I was talking to my wife and I said, listen, that guy just had 440. I do not expect this to be more than 150. And she was like, you're kidding me. This is at least 300. And I was like, let's, let's have a look. Now, anyway, what happened is that when we went there a year before, I had the same card, like same full. And it was like 120, 130. So I was expecting maybe 150, 160, but not 400 or 300. So it's ridiculous. So this is inflation, very bad. And the question is, where does it come from? Now, we do have a belief and we have a lot of evidence for that. That is because they print new money every day. We print, they, they print all the time. Now, and this brought me to a point where I was thinking, I said, Okay, let's have a look at the central bank balance sheet, the Fed or the Europeans or the English, doesn't matter. And you see a major increase in the uh, in the money supply in the last like three or four years, especially after COVID. It just 
went up like crazy. I, I mean, it was always climbing, but now it went up crazy. So if you look at the European balance sheet for the last three years, you see that they printed $700 billion. $700 billion. Now, they flooded the market with 700 billion new do uh, euros, of course, not dollars, euros. The Fed, they also printed a lot, maybe even more. I don't have the number right now. What I was thinking and what I'm wondering is, who has this money? Because, Robin, I, I mean, we, we are clear on that. You don't have it, and I don't have it. And everybody listening outside to this podcast, you don't have it either. So the question really is, who has it? Who in the world has this fucking 700 billion euros? And I want you to go to your politician. I want you to ask your politician, any level of politi politics, who has this 700 billion dollars or euros? Who has it? That is the critical question we need to ask here. And this brings us to a point where people are probably more conscious about money this is what I what I love to achieve is that people think about what what is this money and how come that there is seven hundred billion nobody in the world knows who who has it, probably the rich. However, if you think about it, then you need to think about it. What is this digital dollar, digital euro, this CPDC? Is that really good? No, it's not. Just start thinking about money. And is there an alternative? Do we have good money? Do we have healthy money, as you call it? Have we sound money? And you will find Bitcoin. So going out and talk to people and ask them, you have this $700 billion? Because I don't. And if you don't, who has it? That's maybe an entry to get people more conscious about the danger of CBDCs, about the rotten financial system, the fiat system, and introduce to Bitcoin, which is sound money, which is something we should embrace and we can because the technology is there. We just need to use it and build it further and just engage with it. So we actually don't know uh, at all where, where this, this money flows, like the, this, this balance sheet expansion that's not like documented where like <laughs> in, in what sectors they're, they're doing it or? It, kind of it is, but I don't know anybody who would be able to duck, uh, dig into it and find out exactly where it is. I mean, if you just look at the balance sheet of a, of a nation state, like a small one, like, I don't know, Croatia or Serbia or Finland or any, any kind of smaller ones, not to talk about the EU balance sheet or the Fed balance sheet, so much money, but it's significant more money in the last four years than any time ever before. And you see all these scandals, the little scandals, like, oh, there is a million. We, this guy cheated the uh, politics. He's a politician. He cheated for 350,000 euros. We had that. Like, that's nothing. That's just nothing against $700 billion or euros in that case. It's like 700 billion euros. That is 700 million million euros. Think about it. If you don't have it, I don't have it. Let's find out who has it. Ask your politician. Let's see how we get an answer. And if not, think about what we should do and embrace Bitcoin. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great, great story uh, and, a, and a great um, question to, to begin with. Like I always try to, when, when someone asks me like, oh, well, uh, what is Bitcoin and why is it important? I first ask them, oh, what do you think about inflation? <laughs> like that's always right. my entry point to, to get right. someone before, be, because on, depending on his answer, I maybe don't speak about Bitcoin in the next like two, three hours. I maybe have to start talking about the monetary policy exactly. before we even get to, into the Bitcoin topics. Right. And, and this is what I, I think this is a great shortcut because I don't want to explain anybody the monetary system. It's way too complicated. I can talk hours about the monetary system. And, and I did. It's like central, uh, central, um, bank money where is like bank money where is like debt where is like obligations so there's like a ton of i mean all these layers built on sand right is all there and it's all just to hide but at the core where are the fucking 700 billion euros and it's 700 million pounds in the us and i don't even know how much it is in the uh, in in england and i don't even know 
how much it is in the in the US, probably much more. So who has this money? That's the core question. And if you don't if you can't answer it, think about it. Maybe we need to talk about what kind of money is more transparent, more open, more reliable? What kind of system is immutable? Where can't they cheat? And all roads lead to Bitcoin at the end of the day. How do you expect that to, to continue? Will they ex implode in at some point? The financial system? Well, there will be a big scandal. There will be a, a huge, huge, huge crash like 2008 and 2011. The, the difference or the time difference between the crashes will shorten. But they will save it. They will try to save the system. They will keep on doing it. Because listen, there's millions of people making a lot, a lot, a lot of money doing all this fiat, doing all this fiat system. Yeah, I, I want to go in, in bad words. I mean, they just do it. They have like, they find new financial instruments today and tomorrow. And when they have another one, they pack instruments together and have a third one and It's just a big, big, big scheme. This is the Ponzi scheme, by by the way. This is the Ponzi scheme, not Bitcoin. So if the whole system would go away, millions of people who makes a lot of money will be out of business. They lose everything. Why would they do that? And one of the ways they can maintain the system is, or not, not one of the ways, what they need to maintain this fraud system This Ponzi scheme, they need more control. And this is where we come back to the beginning. If you have CBDCs, you have better control and more control. And you can maintain the Ponzi scheme even longer. Eventually, it will explode. But hey, we had that before. Not in the US in the last 100 years, but in Europe. How many different currencies we had? Just in Germany, where, we, where I'm uh, sitting right now, We had like four currencies in 100 years. And that is just to have control, to control the people and to maintain the fraudulent Ponzi scheme longer. So it will not implode. It will just a bump. It will be a very bumpy road in the future. Very bumpy. Yeah, it's, 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 I, uh, I had Ariel on a few weeks ago where he talked about uh, the Argentina history of money. And this was like, oh, there's like a currency it lived for like two years. Then it, there was the next one. It lived for four years. And I was like, yeah, they, it's like they hyperinflate and then they just make a new one. That's like, yeah, when we look at Argentina or Turkey, apparently even with a very high inflation rate, people don't flock to Bitcoin all at once. Uh, the, the, yeah. the pain is just like, I don't know how, how high the pain has to go that people actually like, oh yeah, like I need to see a, a serious solution. Uh, it's, yes. it's, it's, it's fascinating for me. And, and, and this is why I'm promoting this where of the 700 billions because people don't care about financial system. People don't care about what they eat as long as it's convenient, right? But what people care about is if they tr being treated uh, unfair. And if somebody pockets seven hundred billion dollars and you don't have it and I don't have it and everybody else don't have it, then I I become pissed. I'll be pissed because these people take seven hundred billion dollars and I'm not part of it. And now I want to do something. And this is, I believe, the way to go instead of trying to educate them before on money and all. they don't even care but they care about being treated very unfair compared to the others my personal, personal belief i don't know if i'm right but <laughs> this is what i believe yeah uh, I, th i think it's uh, uh very logical uh, it's, it's interesting um we have an end routine in the podcast where the first question is always the same uh question for every guest Okay. Um, and the question is, what can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about? Uh, stay curious all the time. I love that one. That's a, that's a good one. Perfect. Then uh, let's come to the end routine of the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Oh. The question for you is, what is the most interesting rabbit hole which Bitcoin took you down that is not Bitcoin? <laughs> Financial system. I had no idea about the financial system. I was just one of these lemmings uh, jumping off the cliffs until I got introduced to Bitcoin. And I was like, what is, a, what is money? I mean, what is money? 
And what is a currency? Is that the same thing? No, it's not. And what is central bank money? And what is bank money? And what is debt? And that was a totally new universe for me. And I mastered it. I mastered it so much more than most of the bankers I talk to. I can, I can, if I talk to a banker, I can ask him three questions and he's out of, he doesn't want to talk to me anymore because he knows now, oh, I'm such, I don't have any idea about what's going on. So that's one rabbit hole, and I'm still deeping, uh, digging deeper because I'd be very curious. Do, do you did you already work in ba with banks uh, before Bitcoin? No, 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 no. I just got introduced. I introduced Bitcoin to the bank, and now oh. I understand banks. I I wasn't even attached to the financial system at all, beside being a user and beside being cheated by <laughs> many financial people. But uh, no, no, I just got in it. And, and also there is a lot of nuances in the system, like the community banks saving loans and things like that in Europe and, and US. And so there's a lot of uh, difference between these regional banks and the big banks. Uh, the regional banks are so much more urban, uh, the history. Like in that bank I'm consulting mostly, they have customers in the third generations. They're grand grandfather was a customer of the bank and bank helped them at the time in agriculture and now they're helping in building his his uh, other businesses so totally different them from the the big banks like uh, wall street banks who are much more remote from the customer and just looking at the numbers instead of the people so you can learn in the financial system kind of learn a lot about psychology a lot about people And this was new for me, yeah. Perfect. And before I let you go, uh, where can people find you and reach out to you? Yeah, the yeah. Uh, most important uh, thing is Joe Martin BTC. So in almost all uh, cha channels, you find me on Joe Martin BTC, like YouTube and uh, any other. If you want to be more precise in German, you find me on my German Twitter, uh, which is Joe Martin DE for Deutschland, DE. But anything else, uh, just Joe Martin BTC. Don't look for don't look for Joe Martin. So many Joe Martins out there. You need to go for Joe Martin BTC or Joe Martin DE. That's important. Yeah, uh, I always do like half an hour of research before with the guests, and I was also like just typing in uh, Joe Martin. I was like, oh, there, there's a lot of things popping up. That's not the Joe Martin I'm searching. Right. But if you type in Joe Martin and Bitcoin in Google and yeah. all the platforms, then you actually uh, yeah. most likely fi find you at like at least at YouTube and Google. Then you were popping up with the uh, keyword Bitcoin to it. Right. Uh, perfect. And thank you so much, uh, Joe, for being on. Thank you so much also for everyone that was listening and watching to this as always uh, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode bye bye